Unleashed. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Matt Dimas here, and welcome to episode 14 of the Matt Dimas Unleashed podcast. Whew, been a minute since the previous episode. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is, man. Just lately, I haven't I haven't really felt like doing anything, you know? Like, you know, just... Uh. Well, I guess the Let's Plays that I lazily ripped off of people's Switch channels and whatnot, and the DDR Pokemon Let's Play that I started, and the Semenology thing, and the Minecraft Chaos thing. I guess I did that stuff. Yeah, it's clear I don't give as much shit about my YouTube career as I used to. I don't, I don't really feel like I need to really elaborate further on that. But um, I'm not going to bitch and moan about YouTube for a millionth time today. Um, I'm going to do a special... Oh, oh, before I start, I just uh, want to let everyone know that the Matt Dimas Unleashed podcast is actually on Spotify now. Hell yeah! Oh, hell yeah! Want to give a shout out to Heather for helping me get my podcast on Spotify. She's got a nice little podcast herself called, uh, was it Just Heather or something like that? And uh, Woman on Mic. And she's all, she also runs a project called Sunshine and Power Cuts. So, uh, and, oh yeah, and a few other projects I'll link in the description. Go check her out if you haven't. She's pretty based for Kiwi, I guess. Um, but yeah, thanks for that, Heather. Anyway, seeing we talk about the Pokemon movies in the previous podcast, in this episode, I think we should talk about Pokemon itself as a franchise. My life experiences with it, how it affected my childhood, the way it opened me up to this new world of social interaction and this cultural revolution that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s, how it got me through tough times in my life, and what I think about the current product, and could I recommend it to any newcomers to the series who might not have bothered to pick it up or are just fresh off playing you know, Pokemon Go or whatever, and are curious enough to listen to a random asshole's podcast about Pokemon. I figured I'd format this episode like an audiobook kind of thing. I always wanted to write my own books and whatnot, and this would be good practice. But, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's begin. The year is 1999. It was an amazing year for pop culture. So many things were dropping in the 90s that would give people a newfound interest in Eastern media. With video games the likes of Final Fantasy VII, Resident Evil, and all sorts of other stuff. As the year 1999 was coming to an end, I became enamored by the byproduct of this newfound interest in Eastern media, and the whole pop cultural revolution in general that was going on at the time. I spent countless hours consuming anime, music, games. It was an interesting time to be a kid. Dragon Ball Z, Toonami, WWF Attitude, Eminem, we were transitioning into this incredible new era. And this all got to a fever pitch, the instant Pokemon fever exploded. When Gen 1 was released outside of Japan in late 1998, I doubt the developers could have ever imagined that by November 9th, 1999, Pokemon would be so big that Jeff Bezos would be hugging a goddamn stuffed Pikachu. Things start to pop off down here, at least in Australia around late 99, somewhere around there. I can't exactly remember. Probably whenever the first movie came out in theaters here, which would have been November 12, 1999, which was a few days after that Jeff Bezos picture, I guess. Whatever time it was that things started to get really crazy down here, I became instantly hooked on Pokemon. I was still playing my Sega Saturn around that time. Truth be told, I was pretty behind when it came to gaming. But as soon as Pokemon and anime and all sorts of shit started to get absorbed into my brain, I tell you what, man, I caught up pretty quick. The Pokemon cards were making the rounds at my school in late 1999, and I was enamored with what was going on, but I never managed to get my hands on any of the cards. Mainly because Pokemon was quickly banned in the school. But it didn't stop us from trading. It became the equivalent of being in possession of crack cocaine. We used to still trade in the shadows out of sight. The poor souls that were caught in the act were punished by having their Pokemon cards confiscated. But the teachers could do little to quell the fever that was Pokemon fever. Things started to get a little bit nuttier as time went on, as kids used to have fist fights over Pokemon cards. I remember one particular incident when two kids were fighting over a holographic Charizard. 
I mean, the good reason. I mean, Jesus Christ, <laughs> it's a holographic Charizard. But still, it was kind of weird to look at, and I can understand why teachers wanted to ban it, but still, it's like, you know, it's just, who cares? I mean, people are going to be stupid regardless of what they're interested in, so I don't see the point. And neither did all the kids that were affected by the ban. They would protest it and fail, but there wasn't really any escaping it. Pokemon consumed the schoolyard. And you couldn't go anywhere without people talking about Pokemon, playing the Pokemon games around the back of the library, or wherever else they could keep out of the sights of the teachers. But yeah, kids used to fight over cards all the time, and it was a regular thing. It wasn't anything too serious, to be honest. I mean, for God's sakes, it's elementary, primary school kids, but it was still kind of... It was, it was weird to see people react so aggressively over pieces of cardboard. As the year 1999 started to come to a close, I decided to go on holidays and just do whatever. I wasn't really paying much attention to anything else other than Pokemon at the time, as the buzz for it was just building up, it wasn't stopping. My uncle bought me my first decent PC in late 99, and I started to go on the internet a little bit and start to realize exactly what the hell I was missing. All these rumors were flying around that people would post about on their fan-made websites that they would make on GeoCities and Angel Fire and whatnot. Rumors such as the infamous Poke Gods and Pika Blue and a whole bunch of stuff about catching Mew and whatnot and stuff you can do with Missing No. Which was always fun to read up on even though I knew 90% of the stuff they would post was BS. Although there was some stuff that wasn't BS, like the official screen caps of Pokemon that would be coming to us in gold and silver. It was all in Japanese and I couldn't understand it, but it was still cool to look at. And then I noticed that Meryl was basically what everyone thought Pika Blue was, and I'm like, Okay, I guess we can throw that rumor out the window of Pika Blue ever existing or ever being a thing. I mean, there was a clear disconnect between the East and the West when it came to media. And a lot of the stuff that was coming out in Japan, most people in the West had no idea was even a thing. That included Meryl and a bunch of other new Pokemon that debuted as early as the Pikachu's Summer Vacation movie that came with the first movie as a short. And that particular short actually came out in the summer of 1998 in Japan as well. Before we even got the damn Pokemon games. The first ones. We were way behind, but thanks to the internet making progress, we were able to catch up and thus see the gory shit show, which was the Geo Cities and Angel Fire brouhaha of the late 90s. I always love using the Wayback Machine to go back and look at these old websites and laugh my head off. So many friggin' hilarious rumors, and quite frankly, it's almost insulting how ridiculous a lot of these sounded. But people were so desperate and they loved the Pokemon so much that they would. They would try them out anyway because it's not like they had anything else going on that summer. And what a summer that was for me. It was a new millennium and it felt like a new era. And it felt great. Everyone was terrified of the Y2K shit, but all I was worried about was getting my hands on more Pokemon. Lots and lots of goddamn Pokemon. After weeks and weeks of not being able to get a hold of any Pokemon cards, one of my schoolmates, Jade Kendall, gave me the Pokemon card Ponyta in early 2000. It felt like I was holding the Holy Grail in my hand. It was so freaking cool to me. The artwork, the smell, everything about it was like heroin. Here's a shot of it I took back in 2009. If you're watching the video version of this podcast on my YouTube channel. Needless to say, I was hooked instantly, and wanted to start collecting Pokemon, and trading Pokemon, and buying Pokemon. I wanted all the Pokemon. By the time a few months passed, I amassed a small collection, and had a portfolio where I can put them into. Fast forward to mid-2000, and I was starting to watch wrestling a lot more, and Dragon Ball Z, and Toonami, and whatnot. And believe it or not, the Pokemon anime which actually started to air on Network 10 here, on prime time at 6pm. 
after watching a few episodes, I became even more enamored by the franchise and was ready to consume in the feeding frenzy by the time my 11th birthday would come around that year. How fitting was that though? The target demographic for Pokemon was 8 to 10 years or whatever, and here I was, a 10 year old kid watching an anime about a 10 year old kid trying to be the very best that no one ever was. It was like it was meant to be, you know? On July 21st, one day before my birthday, me and mum went and watched Pokemon the movie 2000. Good god it was awesome. The talking slow king, the legendary birds, Lugia, I was soy facing throughout the entire film. I never got to see the original movie at the theatres, I learned cable TV earlier that year, but it was definitely an experience to see a Pokemon movie at launch in the cinemas during the height of Pokemon fever, with all the kids going nuts over it, and the confused parents staring in awe. I remember leaving the theatre with a renewed sense of vigour, like something woke up inside of me, a primal instinct that required more Pokemon. On my birthday the following day, my mum came through and got me a special edition Nintendo 64 with a yellow controller with the Pokemon logo and a grey controller, with a rental copy of Pokemon Stadium. The version of the system I got was called the Pokemaniac Nintendo 64. It was a special limited edition version of the system. I remember seeing ads for it on TV in late 99 and early 2000. It even came with a VHS of the first few Pokemon episodes and featured a trailer of Voltron, the Third Dimension, and the Sonic OVA. The Sonic OVA trailer with the song lookalike completely captivated me. It was so cool to me at the time as I was a Sonic fan, and it brought back those early childhood memories of me playing Sonic 1 and 2 8-bit on the Sega Master System in 1996 and 7. I rented Pokemon Stadium and WWF Attitude for a few weeks before my mum finally bought me Stadium and then eventually a copy of Pokemon Red, which I could conveniently put into the transfer pack that came with Pokemon Stadium, so that I can play Red version on the Super Game Boy emulator in Stadium itself. It was so cool I didn't even need a Game Boy Color. Or a Game Boy for that matter. I gotta admit, it was, it was a novelty, that's for sure. Being one of the first emulators I ever used, really. I was addicted. I played that shit for hours and hours and hours and hours. I loved battling on Stadium, and I loved using my Pokemon from Red version in Stadium. Round 2 was really tough though, I always got my ass handed to me. Especially by that goddamn gambler, who would always manage to somehow one hit KO my Pokemon. I did eventually beat him, but it took a f ooh, it, it took a lot of tries. The final fight with Mewtwo was cool I guess. But the only thing I was trying to do after being in the game was getting all the starter Pokemon and Eevees from the Jim Lee Tower mode, or whatever the hell it was, so I could complete my Pokedex. Because at the time, I didn't really know anyone who had a copy of Blue version. In the meantime, I just kept playing Pokemon Stadium and Red version over and over and over again. I was having a bit of trouble completing my Pokedex, I remember, because, again, nobody I knew had Blue version, so it kind of sucked. But, you know. Around that time, I remember getting some sort of Pokemon Stadium magazine, where it basically is like a walkthrough to help you through the game. It was some kind of strategy guide by Prima Games, I believe. But yeah, it was kind of cool to read through that. I also had some sort of like red, blue, and yellow strategy guide as well, I guess. Which basically explains, you know, gives you a walkthrough of, you know, each dungeon and whatnot and where to catch Pokemon. And even gives you a, a, a detailed explanation about how vitamins work because, you know, they don't really go into that in-game. And it was nice to finally know how to use them so I could actually, you know, actually use them. But they wouldn't really be that useful anyway because, like I said, I didn't really have anyone I could competitively battle with until, you know, later on. So, you know. It was cool to read about Missing No and Bigger Blue again and all that fun stuff and the Mew under the truck thing, it was, yeah, it was definitely a thing. And I kind of liked it how, like in, how in old magazines when there's spoilers and whatnot, they'll have stuff like upside down or so that you can't read it normally. You have to turn the magazine around to read the spoilers and the spoilers was uh, the fact that Blue was the uh, final opponent, which I already knew anyway, but that was still pretty cool to see that and... Also, Giovanni was uh, 
I think he was just a silhouette in the magazine, which is kind of cool. Instead of, uh, you know, the Viridian gym leader being revealed, it's just a shadowy figure. It's kind of ominous. But yeah, it's kind of funny how magazines back then were designed, and it was definitely very fascinating and fun to read that. If I can find a picture of the Pokemon Red and Blue Strategy Guide, I'll put it up here for you guys. Boom. Uh, but I do have... But I was able to find the Pokemon Stadium one here. So yeah, they're pretty cool uh, magazines to read through. Hopefully I could find the Pokemon uh, Red and Blue one. I'll have to dig through my stuff to remember what it was called. That way I can bring up an image in Google. Anyway, that was a thing. A few months later, before the Sydney 2000 Olympics, my grandma gave me a Pokemon Pikachu, or I think it was also called the Pocket Pikachu. It was this thing where you could attach it to your pants and it would make Pikachu walk with you, or you could just shake it violently like I used to do. It was one of those virtual pet things, I guess. It was pretty fun to play with, to tie me over in between, me constantly getting suspended from school, and car rides to the local butcher a few miles out west from where we lived at Redcliffe. The Sydney Olympics closed in, and me, mum and dad would take a trip to Auckland, New Zealand. For a local football club's event. I don't know, it was something to do with the wreck of Leeds club's clique called the All Boys, that my dad was a part of. It was like some kind of exhibition NRL game or whatever. Beats me, I can't really remember 100%. While we were in New Zealand, the absolute impact of Pokemon stretched all the way out here. The first duty-free shop I saw at the airport when we arrived was full of Pokemon merch. My mum got me a plush Pikachu that I still have to this day. I love that chubby bastard. Again, picture. She also got me the Pokemon Ball Blaster thing. I don't know what the hell it was. It was a Game Boy with like a ball that you shoot at like figurines or... Just look at this picture here. Boom. It was... I didn't know what the hell to do with it, but... <laughs> Hey, I liked playing with it, I guess, while we were in the hotel room. We stayed in the Kiwi International Hotel, I think it was called. I remember getting lost in there one day. And I remember some weird Wheel of Fortune video game was in the main lobby. We began to take a trip to a place called Rotorua. And everywhere we stopped at, all I could see is Pokemon everywhere. Pokemon merch to my left, to my right. It was... It was something. We got to our destination, and I had a look at all the mud pools and whatnot that were, you know, in Rotorua. I can distinctly remember a really strong stench of sulfur in the air. It stunk like hell. I got a picture of me posing next to some sort of a uh, statue here. I'll put that up. Boom. I remember the car ride home from there. I had a seizure for some reason. I guess the smell was too much for me. But... All I remember was feeling pretty ill that day. We arrived back at our hotel room, and I turned on the TV. And lo and behold, there was Pokemon on the television. I felt like I was home again. We took a trip to Rainbow's End, I think it was called, New Zealand, and I had a photo taken of me standing in front of a guy in a Pikachu costume. I'll throw that up there, again, if you're watching the video version so you can see. It was... Really bizarre. But I was definitely enjoying myself. By the time we got home and I was able to, you know, get my thoughts together after that experience, I noticed that Pokemon Snap was a thing. Well, actually it released in Australia in March of 2000, but... Well, March 23rd, 2000. It just got a release in Europe as soon as the Sydney 2000 Olympics started on the 15th of September 2000. So, I'm guessing that's the reason why I noticed it, because it started to get more press here again. I don't know how I completely ignored the initial release, but whatever. Anyway, I started to ask my mom if I could rent it. Lord and behold, I managed to get a hold of it. I gotta say, for a game that was initially supposed to be a freaking rail shooter, Pokemon Snap was definitely a wonderful experience. I really enjoyed it. As soon as I booted it up and I was greeted with the title screen, I was like... Wow, what am I getting myself into? The graphics, the presentation, the sound design, everything about it was mesmerizing. It was, it, it's still such a beautiful game even today, going back and playing it. 
It's one of those things you can boot up and finish in about an hour or two hours. Very fun. A lot of replayability. The only thing I didn't really agree with were the Pokemon signs thing. It's like, well, I mean, if you already know where they are, why can't you take photos of them on your second playthrough? Padding, ladies and gentlemen. The game is padding incarnate, but I didn't care. Pokemon Snap served as another product to boost the already astronomical amount of hype for Pokemon. And gave us another reason to adore the franchise even more. I would eventually purchase the game about a month later, so I could play it as much as I wanted, because two weekends just couldn't cut it for me. I loved the game so much that even though you could complete the game and max it out in a couple of days, I just wanted to keep playing it. I didn't want to stop. That's how good it was. The game just had so much playability for me because I just was just tried. I just kept trying to get really good photos and figuring out ways to get them. Like the volcano area with all the Charmanders where you can just throw food at them and they can come, they all come out and, and eat. And then you play the poker flute and they all stare at you directly. And you know, things like that is just seeing what you can pull off if you just mess around in the game for long enough. I mean, <laughs> the Moltres egg stops you for a reason, right? Well, there's your reason. Anyway, I was glad to have another Pokemon game under my belt as I prepared for Gen 2's inevitable arrival. Later that year, I want to say November or December, my mum got me gold version as an early Christmas present. Along with a Game Boy Color to play it on. I can tell you now, it was probably the best moment of my childhood. Getting that game and booting it up for the first time. It is a really friggin' cozy game. Everything about it was so good. It's still good today. The gameplay, the music, the vibe, the aesthetics. Oh, it's so good. I just, I got no words that can describe Gen 2 other than just simply perfection. I remember when I booted the game up for the first time. I was blown away by the graphics and the color, and I was ready to embark on a new journey. I chose Cyndaquil, and I made my way through the Johto region. I guess while we're on the topic of starters, I always picked the Bulbasaur and Red version. Mainly because, well, it made the game easier at the beginning. You didn't have to grind for that much time. And I loved Venusaur. It was pretty cool. I used to teach it Body Slam. And it seemed to do the job, I guess. But, you know. Me and Cyndaquil would wander the land, leveling up setting bell sprouts on fire, and discovering secrets. I felt like I was being pulled into the magical world of Pokemon. It was that intense. I absolutely loved the game. Everything about it, the way it looked, the battles, the soundtrack. I even loved the new mechanics they added, like shiny Pokemon. Genders. Pokerust. The fact that you can actually visit the Kanto region as well, I mean, my god. Gold and silver is definitely more complex than red and blue, that's for sure. I was having a blast. I finally discovered the legendary dogs, found Lugia, Ho-Oh, and the unknown. I was caught up in a mystical world of fantasy and wonder. And I loved every minute of it. There was nothing else I played other than that game for a long time. That gold version was my life for a long time, for several months. As the year 2001 rolled over, I was still having a blast consuming Gen 2, as well as all the other cool shit that was floating around the mainstream that I could gawk at at my leisure. My friend Jared Moore, who I met in my first year of Scarborough State School, which I moved to from Kippering State School in 2000 because the damn place was a shithole, invited me over to play his copy of Silver, browse Newgrounds on his PC, and play his PS1. We used to play Twisted Metal, Ape Escape, all that good stuff. We also traded Pokemon and whatnot. Well, some good times, man. It, 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 it almost gave me the illusion that my childhood was actually good for, for the most part. When well, It was probably one of the early memories that I have from that era that really stood out to me as something just really, really wholesome and cozy. On April 6, 2001, I saw Pokemon 3, the movie, Spell of the Unknown, in theaters. And it was amazing. All the kids were going apeshit. 
I vividly remember it being five days after WrestleMania 17, so my hype thrusters were already in overdrive after that epic pay-per-view that I would constantly watch over and over. 2001 was looking to be another great year for me. As the months rolled on around the same time as last year, well, it was a bit earlier in August, I think, my mum and dad went to New Zealand again for a week or two, but left me behind at my Uncle Leo's house. I still had to go to school and whatnot from there, so it wasn't like it was a vacation or anything. I brought my Nintendo 64 and all that shit so I could play in the TV in the spare room. This kid named Frankie, who lived down the road from my uncle's house, lent me a copy of Pokemon Yellow, and I played it in the stadium. It was definitely a thing, didn't really think much of it. Besides the fact that Team Rocket's in the game and some other stuff. It was cool to hear the digitized, but also utterly terrifying. There was a girl that lived two houses down from Frankie, who let me come over, use a computer, and we played on a trampoline where she used to randomly yell out Bulbasaur. I had no idea why she did that, but it was clear that Pokemon had its kung fu grip tight around the collective minds of young people worldwide. By the time my parents came home, I was invited to my friend Jared's birthday party at his house on the 29th of August, 2001. It was one hell of a night. We went out to his garage, with the TV blaring, Ah, gets the Mr. Hell show. And Limp Biscuit's chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water was also blaring in the background. Somehow, one of Jared's friends managed to get his hand on a Japanese copy of Gold version. I think the kid got it off eBay, which was an alien thing for me at the time. I didn't know shit about shit. Anyway, I tried playing it, couldn't understand any of it, made it to the second gym before giving up. I don't know why I remember that night so vividly. The smell of Phantom mixed with Sprite in the air, the laughter, the chatter, and of course, Pokemon. The early 2000s were a drug I couldn't quit. Around September 2001, my cousin Carl came around with Blue Version, and we battled. It was pretty tough, I still had a lot to learn, I guess. I did enjoy the social aspect of Pokemon, and the rivalries you can develop with it. After 9-11 happened, I was kind of strung out, I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I was getting ready for high school and whatnot, and I was also getting into music as well. And by that, I meant that I was just messing around with a four-track tape recorder and all that. So, you know. But my attention to Pokemon would start to wane throughout, you know, the beginning of 2002 at Oddwoods. And let's just say I didn't stop playing Pokemon, but I didn't play, you know, gold version nowhere, anywhere, anywhere near as much as I played it the previous year. Although, one fateful day in 2002, I was playing gold version at the Rent Completes Club. I was just sitting down in the lounge area, just, you know, playing gold version. And lo and behold, out jumps a shiny Teddy Ursa. To my complete horror, I realized that Teddy Ursa runs away pretty quickly. I tried throwing a Pokeball at it, an Ultra Ball for that matter, to see if I could catch it and get a shiny. It failed. It then ran away. I was horrified. I then realized the harsh reality of what I got myself into now. I had to get a damn shiny Pokemon. And no, the red Gyarados wouldn't cut it. I had to get a shiny Pokemon. I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And I kept failing, no matter what. It would always just not appear. There was actually one day where I played for about 20 hours straight and still nothing. It was, it was really bad. I think I spent the next few months, I want to say from rough estimate here, because I don't know the exact time this particular Teddy Ursa event took place, but February, March, April, May, I spent the vast majority of that time trying to find a shiny Pokemon, and just no luck. I mean, I probably wasn't trying as hard as I could have, but still, I, I got nothing. And if I ever ran into one during my late night binges, I was probably too tired to realize it. In mid-2002, after that year's football season, one of the guys I grew up with and played with, Matt Isaiah, came over and I showed him Missing No and the substitute plushie that replaced it in Stadium, or the uh, Ditto. 
I remember him being impressed with me memorizing the Poke Rap. He even brought it up when I reconnected with him on Facebook in 2010. You can thank the VHS tape I got with the Nintendo 64 for that. On June 15, 2001, Pokemon Puzzle Challenge was released here in Australia, and my mom actually bought it for me for my birthday the next year. I actually really enjoyed playing that, but for some reason, my copy of the game had some sort of uh, battery issue because the save data would just randomly erase itself for no reason. But the game was pretty fun, so I didn't really mind playing it over and over again at the time. And <laughs> what else was I going to do with my time back then? Like during the peak of Pokemon fever, are you kidding me? What else would I be doing in playing Pokemon for God's sakes? But yeah, I still like playing that game even today. I actually booted it up a, a, like a few months ago and just played it from in front of my friends. And yes, yeah, it's, it's very addictive. It's basically Tetris Attack, but hey, the way it was set up, it was re really enjoyable to play. I really liked the gameplay, like the graphics, the you know the, the artwork. It was, it was beautiful. Definitely recommend it if anyone hasn't played it yet. As one of those few games that I remember playing that I actually got really good at. I was amazed with how well I was able to do against the, uh, you know, the really high difficulty stuff and whatnot. I couldn't really do the puzzle mode for crap though, although I tried. I really enjoyed playing the marathon mode. That was pretty fun. It was a good time killer. I I played Pokemon Puzzle Challenge for many years after I got it. As the year two thousand and two continued on, I was just settling into high school and whatnot. And towards the end of the year, I almost finally settled in as well as I could. I started to spend more time at the kids' club at the Redcliffe Leeds Club, where there was PlayStation 1s where I'd play Crash Bandicoot 1 and 2 and Cool Borders 2 and Micro Machines version 3 and a whole bunch of other games that I can't remember right now. There was a TV in the room that would constantly play movies and shows like the Rugrats movie or the Pokemon anime and whatnot. And I remember uh, I remember it was specifically continuously played the episodes of the Pokemon anime that were about the St. Anne and the island that all the Pokemon were stranded on. And the funny thing is, a few weeks before that, I actually somehow got my hands on a book which is about the island of the giant Pokemon, which and, and, and also uh, the stuff that happened on the St. Anne. I actually really enjoyed reading for that book. It was a lot less cringeworthy than watching the anime. <laughs> I can tell you now, but yeah, it was kind of weird watching the anime after reading that book over and over again because you know I memorized you know the book. And I memorized those particular episodes of the anime as well. well. It also helped that they played those episodes over and over again, but you know, yeah, it's pretty cool. I have a picture of the book here if you guys want to see. Bam, yeah, pretty cool cover art. I still have this somewhere in my closet. I don't know if I'm going to bother digging it out. I don't think I'm even going to bother digging out the Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow strategy guide even, to be honest. Maybe one day. I want to say early 2003 was around the time I became friends with a kid named Christian Savage. And we used to talk Pokemon and whatnot during our home ec classes of all things. He had a copy of Sapphire for a while, and I was curious about trying Gen 3 that whole year. I had my eye on Ruby. I was still playing my Nintendo 64 a lot in mid-2003, I was just getting into Ocarina of Time and whatnot. One day around that time, Christian brought over Pokemon Stadium 2 for us to play. It was pretty cool. I was... I enjoyed it. I mean... I didn't want to buy it, but I liked playing it when he was over. As the year progressed, my mum finally saved up enough cash and asked me if I wanted a Game Boy Advance with Pokemon Ruby. I had to think about it. I was a bit hesitant to try Gen 3 because of all the brouhaha I read online about it. How it was basically a clean slate and the soundtrack sounding like dead farting turkeys. But I finally got it in late 2003. I definitely enjoyed playing it. As soon as I booted it up, I'm like, wow, 16-bit graphics. We're in the future now. Yeah, I was a bit cynical at first, but I did start, it, it definitely did grow on me. I did start to enjoy playing it. I, I liked the graphics, like, like I liked the uh, new Pokemon, and 
it, it was fun planting, and I liked planting those berry trees and whatnot, just watching them grow and just grinding up, beating the Elite Four, you know, breeding Pokemon, challenging the, was it the Battle Tower or something? I can't remember. But yeah, it was it was it was pretty good. Even though I had to start from scratch, I don't think it was a bad game. It was it's actually probably one of my favorite generations. I decided to harken back to Gen One for my starter, and I picked Trico. And well, I, I liked the thing. <laughs> and Sceptile ended up becoming one of my favorite Pokemon. It was it, it did its job. As I was making my way through the game, I was actually quite shocked to find out that you actually have a dad in this game. That was that was something that um was absolutely unheard of with Pokemon until then. And it actually got me thinking, are we are we gonna have some some sort of deep story here? Was there some you know sour grapes in a relationship with your mom and your dad or and then Pokemon reminds us that we're not ready for that sort of storytelling. You just beat your dad and then it's on to the next gym. Like, I really hated that. I really wanted a good story for a change, you know? I mean, yeah, I get it. It's a kid's game. That's fine. But for God's sakes, once in a while, can't we just have a little bit of realism and humanity for a change? I mean, my God. I mean, God forbid, <laughs> the vast majority of the... Pokemon fan base probably gets puts up with domestic violence and a whole bunch of shit with their parents or, and they use Pokemon as an escape. Why not try to appeal to the outcasts of the world? I mean, you know, have a bit of self-awareness. But yeah. I continued playing through the game and then I came across the uh, quote-unquote too much water area of the game. And just to be clear, I don't think there's too much water at all. In fact, <laughs> Hoenn is very similar to Kanto in structure. I mean, shit. I mean, yeah, there might be a fair bit more water, but I don't think there's too much at all. By the time I finished the game and beat the Elite Four, I didn't realize that there was actually a fair bit of post-game stuff that you could play around with, like finding the Regis and Latios and Latias. I was kind of fascinated by the whole Regis thing. I mean, using Braille to find them, that was kind of cool at the time. I remember... I had the booklet that came with the game where it tells you how to read Braille or whatever, and that, that was quite captivating. I mean, I didn't really look up a walkthrough when I was playing Ruby version. I was just winging it. I, I tried not to look at walkthroughs, if that makes sense, just to make the experience just that much more memorable, and it was. And when I finally found the Regis, I was freaking out. I'm like, wow, what am I looking at? These look like some sort of robotic rocks. It was definitely fun to find them, and the ways of finding them was very unique and, and, and captivating, and I really appreciated that. Also, Relicanth became one of my favorite Pokemon. I mean, just, just look at this thing. Just look at it. It's awesome. Well, I enjoyed playing Gen 3, but... Yeah, I was kind of at a weird crossroad here. I didn't know if I wanted to continue playing Pokemon for much longer. Um, I didn't really have a GameCube or uh, anything like that. I don't know. I, I just, I never got to play Coliseum or anything or like, you know, stuff like that. But uh, I don't know. I was kind of at a weird spot. I, I, I kept playing Gen 3, but, um, you know, I, I just couldn't help but feel... You know, I, was, I, I did kind of feel isolated in 2004, moving forward. Thankfully, my friend Christian had Sapphire, like I said earlier. And you know what? I was starting to notice a trend. Two of my besties so far and my cousin got the opposing version of each mainline Pokemon game I had. Well, I didn't get Ruby until after he got, you know, Sapphire. But still, I, I would have got Ruby anyway because I got Red version. I'm not complaining. It, it made completing the Pokedex easier in Gen 3. And thank God I had Christian there to help me as, well, the, the Pokemon fever was kind of dying down by 2003, 2004, and not that many people were playing the Pokemon games anymore. So, you know, it, again, I, I felt isolated, but, you know, it was, it was inevitable. I mean, I knew this was coming, but I didn't <laughs> realize it would only take a couple of years for the, uh, the fad to completely wear off. 2004 was a pretty rough year for me in high school. 
or my buddy Christian with his copy of Sapphire would trade with me, battle with me, and take my mind off all the stupid shit. And he always used to love showing off his goddamn shiny Kyogre. <clears throat> I hated him for that. I could never find a shiny Pokemon. I mean, the only shiny Pokemon I found was that damn Teddy Ursa in Gen 2 that ran away from me. I think the only shiny Pokemon I got after that was a shiny Fira on Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu. Where the odds of getting a shiny are better anyway, so it doesn't really feel that much of an accomplishment. Anyway. Ruby version helped keep my sanity until the year was over. And things would start to simmer down. Start to simmer down. It was in late 2004 I got Fire Red version, when I went on holidays to Boonaroo to visit my auntie Pat. We just went to a random Kmart there and we bought it. We got some Hot Wheels games as well, I think there were World Racer and Velocity X. I played the hell out of Fire Red version though. Couldn't get enough of it. I knew it was just a remake of Gen 1, but I was like... <sighs> I was still enjoying it. I mean, I did feel like it was kind of limited. Besides the Sevy Island subplot, which was kind of interesting, but I don't think it really extended the, 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 the game time by much. But I still played it a lot. It was, it was by this time I felt like the only guy playing Pokemon, though, until a little bit later. Around this time, well, starting from before I went on vacation to my auntie Pat's house, I started getting heavy into music and... More into computers and whatnot, and, well, more so than I already was. And I was starting to pay less and less attention to Pokemon as time would go by as we entered 2005. I was getting more into the internet, downloading emulators and getting back into Sonic and all that stuff again. And I was kind of distracted throughout <laughs> a lot of 2005. I was playing my PS2 a lot, Dragon Ball Z Budokai 1 and 2, you know, Burnout 3, Sonic Heroes. GTA Vice City, GTA 3, the original Burnout, um, Thorak Evolution, uh, WWS Smackdown, Just Bring It, you know, all the good stuff. And I was just finding less and less time to play Pokemon, and I definitely uh, was struggling there for a little bit during early 2005 when it came to Fire Red. I did play it whenever I could, but I did quickly get bored of it by, I want to say, uh, March. I pretty much completely lost interest until something happened. In mid-2005, I found out my buddy Christian and my other friend Brendan Wright had a copy of Leaf Green, thus continuing the trend of me having opposing versions. We traded Pokemon and had a bit of fun, but I definitely started to feel less interested in Pokemon. Especially after getting my PS2 in late 2004. Yes, I was late to the party. Eh, who cares. As 2006 was rapidly approaching, I was starting to care less and less about Pokemon and more about my music. I guess you could say my Pokemon days were over right about this time. But um, I can assure you, this is not where the story ends. As the year 2006 hit, I heard about Pokemon Diamond and Pearl coming out for the Nintendo DS. But I honestly had no interest in getting a Nintendo DS or any of the new Pokemon games. I was basically fixated on working on music around this time with my friends and whatnot. Well, I suppose out of curiosity, I did check the Pokemon websites to see what was going down and I noticed a whole bunch of screen caps from the new games that were leaking around this time. And I was... eh. I mean... I really couldn't care less at this time. I was, like I said, I was fixated on music and, you know, messing around with my PS2 and all that. So, I mean, could you blame me? PS2 games were dropping for... <laughs> PS2 games cost about $2 around this time. It was a <laughs> great era to be a PlayStation 2 owner, that's for sure. I mean, granted, there was second hand, but still, I mean, <laughs> what, a, what a time. And also I was getting into the, you know, the Game Boy Advance emulator on the computer and if I wanted to play any new GBA games, I'd just play them on the emulator, but I never played Pokemon. As 2007 came around and I started working fast food and going to college and whatnot, I was pretty distracted, didn't care much for Pokemon. I did play a lot of PC games though, RuneScape, Warcraft, that was fun. 
Fast forward to August 2009, and my interest in Pokemon was piqued again when my friend Ian Roberts invited me to his house. But we were good friends for a while at that point. I, mean, I started hanging out with him a lot in 2005 and 2006. I didn't really see him since I graduated in 2006. We basically reconnected when we met up at the Redcliffe show that year, and we talked about, you know, Smash Brothers brawl and all that, and, and yeah. Anyway, he messaged me on MSN, and he's like, hey man, you should come around sometime, and I'm like, okay. But then, the next day, I arrived. <laughs> I can't forget that day, when I hopped out of the green 76 Ford Falcon Fairmont XC, Ian said, uh-oh, Slash is coming out of the car. I grew my hair pretty long at that point. He showed me Guitar Hero with Trapped Under Ice, and we played Wii and 360 games. He played Ninja Gaiden, and on the Wii, he showed me Pokemon Battle Revolution. It was kind of cool. I was kind of interested, but I, there was something about Pokemon Battle Revolution that wasn't really, I, I, I guess, hooking me. It kind of felt really stilted. I don't know what it was. I have actually played the game recently, and it's all right, but... Back then, I was kind of, eh, yeah, cool, I guess. You know, I wasn't really feeling it. I don't know what was going on there around that time. I wasn't really having the best times mentally around that era either, to be honest. I guess I was kind of wiped out. When Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver became a thing, I didn't really bother to play either. But when I heard that Black and White 2 came out on the Super Effective podcast, I wanted to try Black and White 2 out. I ended up becoming one of my faves. Played it on the emulator, along with Heart Gold. It was like, okay, time to get back into Pokemon. I was hooked again. It was, it, it was on. We're back in business. And then I played X. And it was... Eh? It, it wasn't bad, if, that, if that's what you guys want to hear. I, I just didn't think it was great. It just existed, I, I guess. I... I don't know. Considering it was one of the first 3D, like, mainline games, I suppose, if you want to call it that, I was kind of interested, but it just felt stiff. I don't know what it was. I, I, I didn't really like it as much as Gen 3, especially not as much as Gen 2 or even Gen 1. I don't know. It wasn't that great. My interest started to fade again, even during the rumblings of the Gen 3 remakes and all that other stuff. But when 2016 came around, nothing could prepare me for the utter chaos that was about to ensue. Pokemon Go gets released, and people lose their ever-loving minds over it. People that have never touched a Pokemon game in their lives were taking snapshots of the game and posting it to their personal Facebook pages. I've never seen anything like this since the very beginning of Pokemon Fever in the late 90s. It was truly a sight to behold. For better or for worse. For better, well, it was nice to see Pokemon get some traction again after years and years of just nothing happening. And for worse, and well, people walking into traffic and whatnot. That, you know, because that was fun. Either way, I was glad Pokemon was in the public eye again. When Sun and Moon came around, I was interested, but... Really? We're going to go out in Hawaii or something like that? Wait, what are they doing, you know? As 2017 would roll over, I got myself a Nintendo Switch, and I played a shit ton of Breath of the Wild on it. But later on that year, a game would come out that would catch my attention. Pokémon Tournament DX. Well, the game was already out in the Wii U a while ago, but... You know, Wii U bottom text, so <laughs> I'm not surprised I had no idea that game was a thing, but anyway. Uh, it was good. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I actually have videos of me playing it on my YouTube channel. You guys want to look? Um, it was it's a good game. I like the mechanics and whatnot, and the gameplay. And you know, I, I, when I got finished playing the demo, I went out. I, I bought it digitally. It was alright, and it got me hyped up for whatever new Pokemon game was going to come out that year. And apparently, I didn't really have long to wait. Apparently, uh, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon were going to come out. At first, I was like, eh. Just, well, you know, I might as well have a look, I guess. I was going to emulate Ultra Sun to see if I liked it, and I would later buy it if I did. I then booted up Ultra Sun to give it a try when it came out. And boy, did I make a good move. Pokedex full to the brim, 
a lot of new Pokemon. It was freaking amazing. I could play that game over and over. Even now, even now, I booted it up and played Pokemon Ultra Sun. It is so good. I recommend that game to anyone that hasn't played it. It's definitely really good. I didn't think anything could really break Pokemon's momentum at that point. I was instantly hooked again. I was like, damn. What's going to happen next? What are they going to release next? And then Pokemon Sword and Shield happened. I think you guys probably know what I think about that dumpster fire based on the fifth episode of this damn podcast. Eh. I guess it could have been worse. I did end up buying it and playing it. and then, eh, it's, it's a thing, I guess. I don't know. It's definitely not one of the best Pokemon games ever made, that's for sure. But... <sighs> whatever, I, I just let it kind of slide. Oh yeah, I guess I forgot to talk about uh, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. I did play Let's Go Pikachu when it came out with the $50 Pokeball Plus. You know, so that, <laughs> that came with a Mew, but I didn't get a Mew because I bought mine secondhand from EB Games because they're swindling assholes. <laughs> but you know, that, that's great. A fully completed Pokedex is locked behind a $50 paywall. So, you know, th that's fantastic, but... Uh, it's... It's Gen 1 again. I found a shiny Fero. whoop de doo that was it. I just basically just stopped playing after, like, 100 hours. It was... It's Gen 1. Why are they... This is, like, the, f the, the second Gen 1 remake. Like, wh Why? But whatever, I guess they wanted to capitalize on Pogo's success, but I was just not giving a crap, you know? But yeah, I don't know what else to add. Again, Sword and Shield happened. It's a thing, it's, it wasn't great. But I'm looking forward to the Diamond and Pearl remakes to see if they're any good. I'm probably not going to buy them, I'm going to pirate them before I buy them. If I don't like them, I'm not even going to bother buying them. It's, it's that simple at this point. I was pretty bitter about getting ripped off with Sword version. But, I mean, what are you going to do? Nintendo as a company ain't really the best either lately, so, you know, you can't, can you really blame me for being a little bit cautious at this point? But yeah, that's about all I have to say about Pokemon as a franchise. I hope you guys enjoyed listening. Um, I don't know what else, I don't know what else to add to this, but I guess that's it. Thanks so much for watching and listening, and I'll see you guys later. Take care.